Greetings, salutations, and welcome to Sports Like the sports television program for the high plains of West Texas and Eastern Mexico. I'm your host, Doc Elder, rocking a goatee for the first time ever on Sports Look. And in honor of that change, we're going to change things up a little bit on Sports Look. We're going to have a couple of members of the Greyhound Cross Country Squad. We're going to have Josh Prock, who, of course, is the head basketball coach for Greyhound Women. We're going to have a high school spotlight courtesy of Landry and Orlando. I'll finish up with an overtime, but as always, I'll start out with an Eastern recap. If I believed in the principle of biorhythms, I would think that every Eastern athlete was on a triple low on Saturday because Saturday was not the best day ever in our school's history. Greyhound football playing against a really good team lost 49 to 10. Greyhound soccer, the men had a close match but lost 1-0 uh, to the University of Texas International down in Laredo. We also had the Greyhound women playing against Texas women's, they lost 3-1 and Greyhound Volleyball playing against Lubbock Christian over in Lubbock. They lost their match 3-1. to one. Greyhound Rodeo, the ladies had a chance on Saturday. Unfortunately, had a couple of girls come up a little bit short in the final go, and so they finished in 10th. The guys, unfortunately, didn't even get a finish in a place. So, like I said, bad day for Greyhound Athletics, but the good thing about Sports Lick, there's always next week. There'll be a different recap. Well, that has been your recap for this week, so we'll clear this out and we'll bring in our first guests, Jesse Madrid and Kayla Cisneros, right now. Welcome back to Sports Look, and we bring to the set of Sports Look two members of the Greyhound Cross Country Squad. We've got Kayla Cisneros, we've got Jesse Madrid, and welcome to Sports Look. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Kayla, we'll start out with you. Uh, where are you from originally, and what was the process that got you to Eastern to run cross country? I'm originally from Roswell, New Mexico. I graduated from Goddard High School after being captain of the team for four years and going to state for five. I then went on to run at New Mexico Military Institute for their junior college team, and I graduated with my associate's degree and was recruited to come run at Eastern. Very good. And Jesse, how about you? Um, I ran for Hobbs High School. I ran four years cross country and track, and I got an, uh, an offer to go to South Plains College, in which, which I ran two years there. Then I transferred here to keep on running and get, get my education finished. Well, Jesse, I'll ask you this question, and Kayla, you can uh, be clued in because I'm going <laughs> to ask you the same one. Uh, why Eastern? I mean, after you got done running at the junior college level, you could have gone to any number of places. Why was it Eastern that you chose? Well, for me, personally, uh, um, Eastern was close to home for me. Um, also, like, the, I know the coaching was like, like, I talked to the coach. I know he was experienced with coaching and, like, you know, I'm, I'm just trusting the program and like, I'm like really excited to like see what it brings, you know, like I, since it was close to home, that's one of the things that made me stay here. Very good. And Kayla? Kind of like Jesse. <laughs> I wanted to stay close to home and I really like this part of New Mexico, just the atmosphere, the environment, and then also coming here knowing that the program was really good, it has a really good reputation, and the coaching too I knew was going to help me not only become a better runner, but help me do the best I can while I still am able to be an athlete. When you were younger, was running always your forte, or did you play a number of sports and just gravitate towards running? Oh no, I did just about everything. I did competitive gymnastics, I was a cheerleader, uh, I'm a second degree brown belt in judo and then I started wow. <laughs> I started running when I was in seventh grade and here we are. Been there, done that in many regards. I'm very impressed. Well, Jesse, how about you? Um, I always liked soccer as a kid. That was like my main thing. I always did soccer, not, not really any other sports, but as I got into middle school, I started like realizing that I was a pretty good runner. So once I got into high school, you know, I just, I just stuck to track and cross country and that was about it. Obviously, in a perfect world, if you're a distance runner, you've got endurance and you've got the speed to finish with a strong kick. 
Uh, do you have both of those, or if there's one or the other that you're better at, which one is it? Well, I've always been more of like a distance runner. More, I have more endurance than, so like when it comes down to like that kick, the sprinting at the end, it, I'm not really the best at that, but you know, I'm working on that. I've been working on that throughout the past few years, but mostly I've just been mostly endurance, you know, that's my main part right there. Very good, and Kayla will ask you, what's the MO on you as a runner? I'm not the sit and kick kind of runner. I Truth be told, I struggle with my kick. I have a lot of endurance and consistency throughout the race and just building up a little bit of speed each kilometer. That is where I tend to be stronger in, but my kick is not always the best. <laughs> and in terms of Coach Cavaluna, you talked about the fact that uh, you wanted to stay home, you know, close to home, but there also had to be a connection. You had to really think, like you said, that this was a guy who could help you improve as a runner. What was it about Cavalunas that impressed you? I read up on his bio when I was being recruited and just read the number of schools that he's coached before and the fact that he's coached several All-Americans. And that's honestly been a dream of mine as long as I've been running is to hopefully have an All-American or an All-Conference honor while I'm still able to run. So. I knew that this was the place I wanted to go in order to do that and the person I could trust to help me get there. And Jesse, for you, what was it about Coach Cavalunas that impressed you? Well, I know Coach Cavalunas. I've known him before since I was in high school. So I, I know he's an experienced runner. And, you know, I trusted that the program was going to be good. You know, he's, he told me about his athletes. And that's one of the things that made me, like, want to come and, like, try to get a taste of, you know. Now that I think about it, wasn't he a coach at the University of the Southwest, which is in Hobbs at mm -hmm. one time? Yes. Aha! Yes, okay. that's how I know him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm pretty observant mm -hmm. like that from yeah. time to time. Uh, Jesse, so far during the course of the season, you've run in a few meets. Uh, what's been the high point of the season for you personally? What do you think the high point's been for the team? Well, um, Personally, I think like this past meet that we had in Kansas, it was at Fort Hayes, Kansas. Um, I feel like that was one of like my better meets that I had. You know, like the training has been building up to it. You know, and as a team, you know, um, we we've been building up as well. You know, um, there's been like a few injuries that some of our athletes have had here and there, but like honestly, I feel like it's all going to come together. You know, um, by the way it's looking right now, like the training, everything is coming together. And I really, I'm really excited for a conference coming up because um, from the way I felt um, this past meet, it gave me a lot of confidence in not only myself, but also my team. Very good. And Kayla, I'll ask you the same question. What's been the high point for you personally and from a team standpoint? I agree that my best meet so far, like Jesse's, was the Fort Hayes meet out in Kansas this week. I ran my best time ever and the women of Eastern got fourth. So. I think we stand a really good chance at conference and are definitely a competitive squad and a team to beat out there. In terms of your off-season training, I, what did Coach Cavalunas say? Did Coach Cavalunas just say report in August in shape, or did he say you might want to think about running this many miles and doing this type of regimen? We actually had a set schedule that we had to follow all summer. So it was basically eight to nine weeks of training. You have a specific mileage you have to meet each week, along with a little bit of lifting every other day, and then just taking the occasional rest day to make sure that your body is recovered and that you're not going to hurt yourself later by not giving yourself enough rest. Very good. And Jesse, how about you? Did Coach Cavalinas diagram a regimen of training for you as well? Um, yes. It wasn't a very specific one, but he did tell me, like, a specific amount of mileage that he wanted me to do. So, like... Throughout the summer, I built up like my mileage every week. You know, um, I built up to around 80 through 85 miles a week. And that honestly got me in pretty good shape for August, which I felt pretty good, you know, coming into the season. It was probably the strongest I've ever felt coming into a season. So I was really excited for it. Well, Jesse, let's look down the road a little bit. And uh, what are you majoring in and what do you hope to do in the future? Um, I'm majoring in biochemistry. Um, I'm, I really have a passion for science. And like, I wanna like, I'm not really exactly sure what I wanna do with my major at the moment, but I know for sure that um, biochemistry and like science is my passion. And I know I'm gonna take the path down that road, so.
Very good. And Kayla will ask you, uh, what are you majoring in and what do you hope to do in the future? I'm pursuing a major in physical education to hopefully become a teacher and a coach. Very good. And uh, do you hope to teach on the high school level or college someday? I'd actually like to be an English college professor. So once I get a little bit of high school teaching under my belt, that's what I'd like to pursue and continue to coach cross country and track and then hopefully my biggest dream would be to start a youth running club, so. Right on. Well, I, uh, that was kind of my career path. Uh, I was a high school teacher and coach, and then I got to become a professor. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kayla, Jesse, thanks so much for being our mm -hmm. guest, and we wish you the very best of luck this year in conference and uh, the regional meets. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. For us. All right. Well, that is going to wrap up our first interview spot. So what we'll do is we'll clear the set and we'll queue up the high school spotlight right now. What's up, guys? And welcome back to another edition of High School Spotlight. I'm Orlando Perez. And I'm Landry Widener. Last week, we were able to go down to Landry's hometown and catch her former team. And this week, we didn't go to my hometown, but we were able to catch my home team in the Manzano Monarchs and taking on the Clovis Wildcats. It was a battle of the purples, but we're going to get right into those highlights to see who came out on top. The Clovis Wildcats looking to defend their home field and improve their 4-3 record. The Manzano Monarchs coming out with some smoke, looking to improve on their 2-4 record. All right, we'll get things started with the first big run of the night. That's number one, Justin Webskowski, finding the hole and bursting through it for a 30-yard gain. And they will keep it rolling with senior quarterback number eight, Devin Gillespie, who's under some pressure. But he will escape, send it in the air, and get it to number 14, C.J. Gutierrez, in the end zone for a Wildcat touchdown. This will increase Clovis's lead up 12 to zero with 11-19 left in the first half. The Monarchs trying to get things going on offense. Quarterback Jace Melfi hooks up with receiver Antoine Wilson for a short gain. The Wildcats will regain possession and hand it off to Webskowski, who will cut through his defenders, scramble, make it look easy, and finally he is brought down, but not before he picks up the first down. Manzano looking for a quick score. Melfi drops back and eyes a receiver downfield, but Melfi doesn't see the safety and gets picked off by Braden Romero, and Romero gives the Wildcats great field position. After another change of possession, the Wildcats will get it going through the air and to the middle. There's Webskowski again trying to make the catch, but the ball is quickly intercepted off of Monarch defender number 34, Stone Davis. Clovis back with the ball, and Gillespie throws it up to Malik Phillips, and Phillips climbs the ladder to go and get this one. Now as they get a little closer to the goal line, the Wildcats will snap the ball and hand it off to Webskowski, who will quickly get the ball into the end zone for six. As they attempt the extra points, Gillespie will run right until he finds Phillips open for a successful conversion. This will put the Wildcats up 20-3 with only 50 seconds left in the first half. Manzano shaken but not stirred, awaiting the kick from Clovis. Austin Erickson is back deep for the Monarchs' return. Erickson fields it down the far sideline and immediately hits the hole. He turns on the Jets with just the kicker to beat, and he will. Erickson takes this one 85 yards to the house untouched. Manzano's PAT attempt would be blocked by Clovis, making the score 20-9 just before halftime. The Monarchs will get their next drive going with Erickson faking out the defense and taking this ball down for a huge gain. And he just keeps going and will finally be taken down around the 25. Wildcats offense now still rolling down the field, and there's Phillips again down the middle, and he's going to pull a Heisman on that defender before being pushed out of bounds and getting the first down. The Wildcats getting into a rhythm. Gillespie finds Jaden Phillips on the receiver screen, and Phillips will pick up the first down for the Wildcats. And you don't hear this name enough apparently, Orlando, but here's Malik Phillips again flashing in the end zone, making the contested catch, and adding another touchdown to his stats and on the Wildcats board. They'll run a trick play for the two-point conversion, and there's Wiskowski running this one all the way around the defense and in for two more. This will secure Clovis's lead even more, leaving it at 28 to nine with about three and a half minutes left in the third. Manzano trying to catch a spark on offense, but that Clovis defense has been looking stout all night. 
and holds Manzano just inches short of the first down. Manzano now desperately trying to get something going as number 84 Antoine Wilson makes the catch. But it won't be enough as Clovis will win this one with a final score of 9 to 44. And now as we move on to some rankings, we're going to start with class 6 man with Elida in the 1 spot sitting at a perfect 8 and 0. Springer's in the 2 spot sitting at 7 and 1. Animus is in the 3 spot at 4 and 2 followed by Hondo Valley and Vaughn. And now for the 8 man rankings, Melrose is in the 1 spot at 5 and 1. Tatum is in the 2 spot at 6 and 1. And Manal will be ranked third at 6-0, followed by Mountaineer and Logan. And now moving on to the 2A rankings, Eunice is sitting in the one spot with a record of 5-1, followed by Fort Sumner House at 5-1. Estancia is sitting in the three spot at 6-2, followed by Texico and Lordsburg. In class 3A, Tula Rosa is in the one spot at 5-1, followed by Hope Christian in the two spot at 5-2. Socorro is in the three spot at 6-1, followed by Robertson and West Las Vegas. And now moving on to Class 4A. Portalis is sitting in the one spot with a record of 6-1, followed by Bloomfield, Lovington, Aztec, and St. Pius. In the Class 5A rankings, Roswell is in the one spot at a perfect 7-0, followed by Goddard at 6-1. Las Lunas is in the three spot at 5-2, followed by Artesia and Farmington. And now moving on to Class 6A, Centennial is sitting in the one spot with a record of 7-1, followed by Rio Rancho at 5-2. Cleveland is in the three spot, sitting at six and one, followed by Volcano Vista and Las Cruces. Thanks for watching another edition of High School Spotlight. Before we throw it back to Doc, make sure you like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more updates, photos, and highlights. Once again, I'm Landry Widener. And I'm Orlando Perez, and we'll see you next week. Welcome back to Sports Look. Thanks to Orlando and Landry for that look at Clovis and Manzano. And speaking of Clovis, we've got the pride of Clovis High School, Josh Prock and Coach. Welcome back to Sports Look. Oh, it's good to be back, and I uh, appreciate you mentioning that. Definitely proud of my uh, high school days. And uh, actually, Coach Fulton's got them playing right now, so it's exciting to see. It doesn't seem like that long ago uh, that I saw you play for the Wildcats, and uh, little did I know that someday <laughs> that guy would grow up to be the head coach of the Greyhound basketball team. Yeah, I uh, had a great, great experience there. I had great coaches, and so uh, that kind of led to my love of basketball as well, you know, for the coaches, especially uh, Coach Mike Hankins. Uh, he had a lot to do with where I'm at today, so I always uh, think very fondly of him. And, of course, you had the privilege of going to the University of Oklahoma and being involved in the basketball program there and uh, learned some good lessons there as well. Yeah, I was. I feel very blessed, you know, to be mentored by one of the best that's ever done, that's ever walked the sidelines and Coach Kelvin Sampson, um, to be able to be around his practices every day, pick his brain. And then I was around some great assistant coaches, Doc. I mean, we had some fantastic guys that knew how to recruit, knew how to coach the game, and great at different stuff. So... Anyway, long story short, I, I just feel very honored and blessed by the Lord to be able to have that opportunity and be raised up in coaching, as I call it, you know, by those guys. Coach, uh, it's been an amazing last three years for Greyhound women's basketball. In uh, those two of those three years, you go to the NCAA playoffs, something that had never taken place. And uh, if uh, fate had been a little bit kinder mm -hmm. last year, we would have advanced uh, out of the quarterfinals into the semis. Yeah, unfortunately, we had a, you know, I mean, you know, you look back on it, you, people want to constantly refer to the call, you know, at the end of the game. But there were possessions throughout the game, too, that if we could have had back, we would have, we felt like we would have, we had control of the game and we let it slip away. So, but that happens. And, I mean, you got to continue to give Lexi Hightower for the WT credit. She played a phenomenal game. But, you know, you refer to the last three years, Doc. I mean, we're 42 and 18 in the last three years and what's arguably the best women's basketball conference in the country. And so... I'm very proud of the uh, players that we've had, the coaches that we have. And this goes back even to my first few years here, the young ladies that, were, that helped kind of really lay the foundation and the groundwork to where we're at today. So there's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of coaches that have been involved, and I'm just very grateful and honored to be able to be sitting here today in the situation we're in. 
Last year, you had a couple of seniors in particular that were absolutely invaluable to the success that your team enjoyed. And it's going to be uh, tough to replace uh, Trey Clay and Shelby Jones. Absolutely. Um, those two were, I mean, I think you put in best words there. It's just going to be hard to replace them. I mean, you really can't replace a Triana Clay. I mean, with everything that she did. Um, you know, she's a uh, just tremendous kid off the court, tremendous kid on the court. Uh, Shelby Jones, just, I mean, just a pleasure and honor to have her for three years and the many double-doubles that she was able to achieve throughout her career. You know, it's great to have, you know, Trey's still around, helps us out, you know, as much as she can. And uh, Shelby actually works over in the financial aid office, so we get to see those two young ladies still very often. So it's great to have them still around, but it will be difficult to replace them, and hopefully we got some young ladies that can step into their shoes. You did have some young ladies that were valuable contributors last year, and I'm thinking of one young lady in particular, Zam Cox, who is a true, not, not a redshirt freshman, a true freshman, and she hit a huge three-pointer at the end of that game against WT to give you the lead, and just says volumes about how she came along, that she felt the confidence, and you had the confidence in her to give her the green light to take that shot. Yeah, Zam's definitely uh, a different special kind of, <laughs> uh, however you want to phrase that, freshman last year. I mean, she made so many big shots that, that, you know, our assistant coach, Coach Jennings, referred to her as Big Shot Zam, you know, and she did. She hit a lot of big shots throughout the year. She came in pretty confident, you know. I mean, she was very well coached in high school by Coach Wade Fraze. Uh, her mom and dad, you know, Gary Cox, who everybody remembers, was a very good basketball player in his own right. Um, so he, she had a lot of great training growing up. And she just, just believes in herself and confidence. And, you know, going into this year, I mean, I know there's other teams that have great point guards, but I feel like we have as good as anybody in the league. You had two young ladies that really impressed. I, I knew how good Zam was going to be. I had two players that really stepped up for you. I'm going to talk about one in particular, Kamira Decker. Beginning of the season, end of the season, world of difference between the two. Yeah, and, I, you know, with a freshman, I mean, we've seen this, you know, Doc, you've been doing this a long time as well, that, it takes a while to get adjusted to the speed of the game. And once you get adjusted, you know, then that's when this, the light bulb starts coming on. And you're right, towards the end of the year, the light bulb kind of came on for Kamira. And, um, you know, it's only going to be great things, you know, moving forward. And so I was very, very proud of the progress she made. Um, and she's just hungry to build on that progress this year as well. The other player that impressed me from start to finish was Chelsea Hunter. You had told me how good of an athlete and the potential – it looked like at the beginning of the season she was, you know, kind of feeling her way a little bit. But, uh, boy, especially down the stretch in that game against WT in the NCAA tournament, she showed exactly the, what you told me she was going to be able to bring to the table. She's a very tough kid. I mean, I know she's, she, you know, throughout her career she's had to battle through some injuries. And uh, Chelsea's a great, she's a great leader in a sense that she, she talks all the time. She's always encouraging. Uh, she's hit some, she had some lot of big shots, especially in the game that you mentioned. One thing I remember about that game in particular, though, just her defense, you know, because her athleticism lends itself to be a good defender. And so she made a lot of really good defensive plays, and we're going to keep uh, relying on her to do that this year. And in terms of bringing in new players, uh, you've got some uh, pretty good kids that you're bringing into the fold. Yeah, we're real excited. Uh, well, obviously, young lady, uh, six four kid, biggest kid we've had since I've been here, Natalie DeLong. Natalie's uh, just the one thing when you watch Natalie that stands out about her is her footwork. You know, she's going to. She's just tremendous, has great feet, has great touch. Uh, Jasmine Williams, just kind of a junkyard dog type mentality. I mean, she's tough. She's physical. She's been through the wars in Division I as well in junior college. And so Jazz will be great for us. Um, you know, we have a kid named Anisha Hurst who comes from a tremendous junior college program at Kirkwood College. Who They're used to winning national championships there. So, it's, you know, Anisha is kind of a jack of all trades as a guard. Taylor Hall is a freshman from um, – uh, Arizona, Castile High School there in Gilbert. Uh, really, really talented young lady. Um, Julia Chavez, you know, a young lady we got from Rio Rancho High School. Really tough kid as well. People are going to enjoy watching her. Um, I want to make sure that, you know, I don't forget about Taylor Rippey. You don't want to forget the pride of Patalas High School. Exactly. Um, Taylor's really coming along too. I'm really proud of her. She's got a great attitude. She's really working hard. Um, you can see the progress that she's made already. And uh, so we, we've got a great crop of new kids that we're excited about. Pair those with the girls that we've got coming back, and it should be a fun year. Well, it's going to be an interesting year. I, I think it's going to be a fun year, but I know it's going to be interesting because the conference is a little <laughs> bit bigger this year. Yes, sir. 
we uh, we've expanded. We're at 18, I think 18 teams, correct basketball wise. I think it's 19 teams total, but 18 basketball teams. So we're we're excited uh, about what we have as far as um, as far as you know the new it's a pod system now, Doc. Yes. So you have three different pods of six teams, and so when they broke the Heartland up, you know they had to break them up into the geographical area. Well, it just so happens that our geographic area is Lubbock Christian, who's won the national title two of the last four years. So, you know, they're going to be in our, but, you know, as a competitor, you love it. You want it. I've got, obviously, the immense amount of respect for Coach Gomez and his program, and it's going to be fun competing against them twice a year. And, Coach, in the uh, limited time we've got left, when is it going to be the first time we're going to get a chance to see your ladies on the hardwood at Greyhound Arena? Well, at Greyhound Arena won't be till December 5th. You know, um, unfortunately, it's kind of the way the schedule fell this year. We, we plan a uh, tip-off classic, you know, uh, whatever conference challenge. But, you know, it rotates every four years. So this year will be at Fort Lewis. And then just the way the conference schedule works out, we're going to be on the road. But December 5th will be our actual annual youth day. And I know you and I will probably, be, between now and then, we'll get a visit about that. And, um, you know, if fans come to the game, you might want to bring some earplugs. You know, there's, we're actually going to – this year's got a chance to, for that game – Bigger than we've ever had it, Doc. Oh, my gosh. If I added up the numbers correctly, we should have over 3,000 that day. Wow. So. Well, Coach, I'll, I'll start uh, selecting the proper <laughs> industrial strength earplugs right now. But Coach, congratulations on the success you've had and best of luck this year. Thank you. We look forward to it, Doc. All right. Well, that is going to wrap up the interview segment of Sports Looks. So what we'll do is we'll clear the set, and I'll finish up with an overtime right now. As I mentioned in my introduction, I am sporting a goatee, and that got me thinking, who had the best beard in the history of professional sports? Could it be Justin Turner, who played for the Dodgers and sported a long, shaggy red beard in the Dodger playoff run last year? How about Ryan Fitzpatrick back in the days when he was really playing some good football for the Buffalo Bills? Nah, I think all of you would agree with me that that honor has to go to James Harden, the bearded one of the Houston Rockets. But it got me thinking about another question, and this is for you, the audience, to ponder. Who was the first professional athlete to sport a beard? Give up? Well, I know, but I'm not going to tell you until next week. You'll have to tune in next week if you want to find the answer to that question. That's what we call my friends a teaser. Well, that is going to wrap up in overtime, and that will wrap up an episode of Sports Look. I'd like to thank my guests, Jesse Madrid and Kayla Cisneros from Greyhound Cross Country, Josh Prock from Greyhound Women's Basketball, Orlando and Landry for a high school spotlight. Mr. Arijah was once again my floor director, so for all those aforementioned people, this is Doc Elder saying, so long. But Melfi doesn't see the safety and gets picked off by Braden Romero, and Romero gives the Wildcats great field position.